Greetings. My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah. Where is the book of Nehemiah at? Well, if you know where Psalms is, you go back a little bit before Psalms and you'll find the book of Job and then right up before Job, I guess you got what, Esther and then Nehemiah. So if you can find the book of Psalms and kind of slowly start heading back towards Genesis, you'll find the book of Nehemiah. I know that some of you, you, uh, you did not receive the phone call this morning about the 8.30 service, I apologize for that. I don't know, uh, I do the call them all, and some of you had indicated that you've got a message on your answering machine, or that a live person answered your phone, and so maybe you need to check your house, make sure no one else is living there. I don't know, it messes up, honest, nothing is perfect, but I try to, I will, uh, we will do them on the call them all. It will be, it's on my blog, it's on the website. We now have a Facebook page for Twin Oaks, and if you know someone and maybe you think, you know, they may not know, they would cancel the service, and they may not know, if you would please give them a call and let them know that as well. Probably nine times out of ten, if it's a morning like this morning where it's really kind of iffy, the first step we're going to take is going to be canceling the 830 service since we have that option. So just kind of anticipate that. Not a heavy frost, okay? But if you kind of anticipate, if you think the roads maybe are going to be slick, then kind of anticipate 8.30 service, and then we kind of keep working that way through. So, we're good. It's good to have you here today. It's good to see Wayne Benfield. Uh, how are you feeling today, Wayne? Not much, Not much better. Okay, well, we'll please continue to pray for Wayne. He has vertigo, and I've had that before. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but it is a very... Uh, it's a, it's a bad experience. Your balance, equilibrium is off. So please pray for Wayne that for his healing in that. Many years ago, there was a missionary by the name of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor had a burden on his heart to go to China. And so Hudson Taylor, uh, back really before the days, missions are where they're at today. Today you can go to school and learn how to become a missionary. You can find a mission board either through the Southern Baptist, if you're a Southern Baptist, or there's many other mission boards. You can find a way that will help sponsor you. And so today, it's, it's difficult to go on the mission field, but nothing what it was a century or so ago. Hudson Taylor in the 1800s, God put a burden on his heart for the people of China. And so he became a missionary to China, and he served in China for 51 years, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. During his time as a missionary, Hudson Taylor also helped to equip at least 800 other young men and women to become missionaries as well. And it is estimated that through his ministry, 18,000 or more Chinese people came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. What a great man Hudson Taylor was. What a great man of faith. What a hero of the faith. But notice what Hudson Taylor had to say. He said, all of God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. It wasn't themselves. Matter of fact, probably any great man or woman of God, they have not thought, they they did not think that they could do it on their own. They've doubted themselves. They've relied heavily upon God and the Holy Spirit and the power of God to equip them. And Hudson Taylor said this, all of God's giants have been weak men, just like us, who did great things for God because they reckoned, they wrote it down and and believed that God would be with them in whatever it is that they would undertake to do. We need to hold on to a quote like that. Here lately I've been studying various missionaries and various men and women of the faith, trying to read their biographies and things like that, and it is very, very encouraging to do that to read about men and women of God who have believed God so much in God that God would help them. They believe so much in the power of the gospel that they have been willing to step out and allow God to use them, and God has used them in a great way because of their faith in God. We're going to read of a man here today, 
in the Old Testament. His name is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was a great man of God as well. One of the amazing things about Nehemiah, if you would go to a Christian bookstore today, and if you would try to buy a book on spiritual leadership, I guarantee you, Every Christian book you will ever buy on spiritual leadership will have at least one reference to Nehemiah, and probably 75% of them will be written about Nehemiah. He is held up more as an example of becoming a spiritual leader, and God using him more than Moses, more than Peter, more than any of the disciples. I would say even, and I say this respectfully, take it in the right way, probably more books have been written about Nehemiah and his leadership than even about Jesus Christ and his style of leadership. He was that great of a leader, yet he wasn't always a leader. There was a time when he had a pie job. But it's amazing how that God took this man's life and turned him into such a great man of God and used him in such a great way. It says in verse 25 of chapter 1, Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah tells us just very quickly in that very last sentence of chapter 1, he said, I was the king's cupbearer. He was living, he was a Jew that was living in Persia. About, oh, a couple of hundred years or so before Nehemiah was born, the Jewish people had been invaded, first of all by the Assyrians, later by the Babylonians, and many of the Jewish people had been carried away into captivity. Some of the more famous ones would be Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were young Jewish men that were captured by the Babylonians and taken back to Babylon. Then eventually the Babylonians fell to the Persians. The Persians became the world leaders of that day. Nehemiah was living in Persia. He was a Jew living in Persia. And by the providential hand of God, he really had a very good job. He was the king's cupbearer. What does that mean? It means that before the king would drink any wine, Nehemiah first would taste the wine to make sure that no one was poisoning the king. As long as the king didn't have any enemies, Nehemiah had a good job. That was pretty much what he did in life. Yet God had placed him there in that position because God, much like Esther, much like Moses, much like Joseph, much like many of the people in the Old Testament, God would place them in these strategic positions so that the proper time, even as it was said to Esther, God would raise them up for such a time as this. God had placed Nehemiah in this position where he had daily access to the king of Persia, the most powerful man on the face of the earth. Nehemiah was there every day, had conversations with him every day by the providential hand of God. But not only was, a, was he a cupbearer, Nehemiah was a chosen vessel. God had purposefully placed him there to use him in a very strategic way. You know, Jesus said this, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. The Bible says the reason we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior is because the Lord, out of His grace, has chosen us, number one, to salvation, but then secondly, to service. And I do believe that very much. I look back at my life, and I look at the events of my life, and I look at the events of my parents' lives, and I look at the various things that God laid out in my life, and now, I, at, at first I couldn't, but now I can understand why I'm a pastor. I can see how God, even before, even before my family became Christian, yet how God was working, orchestrating the events. And the Bible teaches us that God has done that with every one of our lives. Every one of us. We're not, we're not just saved just so we don't have to go to hell. We are saved to be chosen vessels that God can be glorified through our lives. He's given us, I've taught about this, He's given us personalities. He's given us spiritual gifts. He's given us life experiences. He's given each of us a variety of abilities so that He can take all of that and by the Holy Spirit put it together and use a Leon Ingram to help us pull off a sportsman banquet. Seriously. Or a lot of you. Uh, Steve Spencer, to draw and things, things like that, so we can have a puppet, or whatever it is, Jennifer Music, whatever it is. God has done that. He's placed all of that together so that He can use us in a very strategic way. Jesus said, our Father is glorified when we bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. What is God's will for your life? God's will for your life is to bear much fruit, spiritual fruit through your life for His glory. Now look at verse 1 here of Nehemiah chapter 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah the son of Hekeliah, And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year, I was in Shushan, Shushan, the palace. 
that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. What's he talking about? Nehemiah's in the palace. One day he meets some of his Jewish brothers. Some believe that maybe Hananiah was actually his physical brother. But he met these Jewish men who had recently made a trip to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was asking them, so what's going on in Jerusalem these days? I know that several uh, were able to escape the captivity. I know that several have already returned back. And over the last hundred years or so, they've been in the process trying to rebuild back the city of Jerusalem after the Babylonians destroyed it. Verse 3. They said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. He's saying things are no better than they ever were. They're living in shambles. They're living in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem pretty much still looks like it looked when the Babylonians were invading it. Most cities in that day would have a wall around it for protection. You know that. Well, what the enemy army would do, one of the first things they would do is either build a siege ramp to go over the wall or they would tear down the wall so that it could go right through the wall and march right in. And they would destroy the wall around the city because if you could destroy the wall around that city, you could destroy that city. You could capture the people. You could take away their strength. You could take away their protection. They would be vulnerable to any enemy from that point on until they could rebuild the wall. And Nehemiah's brethren said they still have not been able to rebuild the walls. Matter of fact, they said they still don't even have gates up. They're just living in these ruins there trying to exist. Now, how would you react to that? You got a good job. Things are going well for you. You're the king's cupbearer. You're living several hundred miles away. How would you react to that? Well, maybe we'd say, well, you know, I'll, I'll say a prayer for them. Well, notice what happened to Nehemiah. Verse 4 says, And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned. The two words right there are used are the words that are used the way that we grieve when we've lost a loved one. To mourn, to grieve over what is happening to these people. He says, I sat down and I wept and I mourned certain days and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, how long was, were certain days? If you will study the time sequence here, four to five months. For the next four to five months, Nehemiah was consumed with this burden of the affliction that his people were living, what they were enduring. You know, there can be a lot of activity in a church. There can be a lot of busyness. There can be a lot of noise. But it's not really ministry until there's a burden. True ministry comes from someone having a burden in their heart because they see that someone else has a need and they want to be used by God to minister to that need. Every message that I prepare, I step back and I think, so if I were in your shoes, what would I need to hear? What would I want to hear? How could I possibly say it in such a way that would help meet that need in your life? And my burden today is to encourage us as a church to be used by God. And not only just to be, but to have a burden as well. Every one of us as a believer needs to have a burden in our heart for other people. If we do not have a burden in our heart for other people, we will go through life and we won't even think about anyone else. The reason we, can I be honest with you, the reason we don't witness to other people is because we don't even think about them. <laughs> We're not even thinking about them, what's happening to them. I had a wake-up call this week. Tuesday, I think it was. My mom called me on Tuesday night. And, you know, as you go through life... Most of us have, I have a lot of friends. I have a church full of friends here right now. But most of us go through life and we have two or three. You know what I mean? Really, really good friends. And I can look back on my life and I would say, I mean, a lot of you, please don't be offended at this, but I probably I think back, especially growing up, I remember a guy that was my best friend in grade school, and I remember in the seventh grade, another guy moved to that area, and he became really, we were just, Sometimes we bought clothes that kind of looked alike. I mean, I, don't, I do not know how many times I stayed at his house. I do not know how many times he stayed at my house. 
we raised each other. You know, we just, we just, everything, it was me and Mike on everything through from a seventh grade all the way through high school. Now, after that, Mike got married after we got out of high school, and we kind of, I went off to college and different things like that, and we kind of, you know, we, I didn't see Mike for a number of years. Here and there, when we were living in Chattanooga, Mike came through one time. He gave me a call. That was about 25 years ago, and I went to see Mike one night, and we talked, and that's the last I'd seen Mike for 25 years. And my mom called me Tuesday night, and she said, do you know Mike's got cancer? I said, no. I said, Mom, you got to give me his address. So a little bit later, my sister-in-law emailed me, and she said, Mike lost his battle with cancer this morning. And you know what I'm thinking the most? I'm thinking, I went through high school, and I knew the gospel, and I never once told Mike, never once told him about how to be saved, how to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I was so wrapped up in myself. I was so wrapped up in being cool and people liking me and doing all that kind of stuff that I did not share with my very best friend how to be saved. And that's all I could think about. And my sister-in-law emailed me and she said, you will be pleased to know that Mike accepted the Lord last summer as his Savior and he was baptized. I'm like, oh, thank you, oh God, for that. Thank you. So Tammy went with me. We went up Thursday night to the viewing there, and, and it, this is kind of crazy, too. We were in line there, and there was this one other friend that I wanted to see there. And we were going through the line, and we actually pray for us. Some, we met someone that I haven't seen since high school. It was one of my coaches. I haven't seen since high school. He came to us. He started talking with us. So he said, so what are you doing now, Cubby? And I said, well, I live over in Franklin County. And I said, I'm a pastor. You're a pastor? I said, yeah. And you know what he did? He walked with us the whole way through. A few minutes later, he said, you know, he said, you won't believe it. He said, I went to church a couple weeks ago. I said, I am so proud of you. He said, you won't get, he said, I went two Sundays in a row. <laughs> you know what Tammy and I are thinking? God, 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 God. And so I got, he, we exchanged phone numbers, pray for me. I'm going to call him. I want to sit down and talk with him and say, you know, coach, I'm glad you're going to church. Have you ever accepted Christ as your Savior? You know, to be honest with you, and I don't always have this, but to be honest with you, that's the way we need to go through life as God's people. That's, that's God's will for our life, to go through life thinking about who can I talk to, how can I talk to them. That person, oh, I've never shared with them. To be honest with you, that's the way we need to approach the sportsman banquet. The goal of the sportsman banquet is not for us to walk away and say, well, I bet we had four or 500 people. Who cares if all we do is just feed them alligator? <laughs> Seriously. The whole purpose of it, and I've talked, we've talked it among ourselves, the whole purpose, and this, this, we've approached it that way in every year, and I look back, whenever I think, is it worth it? I see Harden Crumb, you know, and I know that it is worth it to know that Harden accepted Jesus Christ through this, and I'm, I pray that others have as well. But I am pleading with us, not just as our men, I am pleading with us as a church body to enter into this week in a spirit of prayer, asking God to work in our lives, in the life of the speaker, in the lives of the men and women who will come next Saturday night, praying with our antennas up, just wanting to reach out to them, just praying that God will speak to them in some way. I want us to, with that intensity, so that when we come in here, and that's the reason, Tuesday morning, we're going to set up, yes, we're going to do all that, but gentlemen, before we do all that, we're going to feed you some breakfast, but we want to have some prayer time. Wednesday night, come Wednesday night, because what I intend to do Wednesday night, we're going to do some setting up for a few minutes, but I want to put us throughout this building, groups in the, in the fellowship groups, in the kitchen groups, throughout this church, praying over it walking through there and praying that the Spirit of God will be so strong that when people come next week, that, that they will accept Christ as their Savior. God put that kind of burden on Nehemiah's heart. When he heard the news, what his brethren, what they were going through, the Bible says he sat down and he wept and he mourned and he fasted. What does it mean to fast? To fast means that you are so consumed with a burden that you're willing to set aside the luxury of food so that you can spend that time in prayer. That's what it means to fast.
to dedicate yourself to that time of prayer. And so Nehemiah spent the next, I don't know that he fasted four to five months, I don't believe that, but it seems that periodic times throughout that, for the next four to five months, he was consumed with this desire to go back and to help his brethren. During Hudson Taylor's life as a missionary to China, he was able to equip over 800 other missionaries as well. One day he was interviewing some of the candidates, and he asked them this question. He says, why do you want to become a foreign missionary? One individual said, well, we've been commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. Hudson Taylor said, that's right. Another said, millions are perishing without Jesus Christ. And he said, that's right. The various missionary candidates came to Hudson Taylor, and they gave them the reasons they wanted to be missionaries. Then Hudson Taylor said this to them. All these motives, however good, will fail you in times of testing, trials, tribulations, and possible death. There is but one motive that will sustain you in the trial and testing, namely the love of Christ. The love of Christ. That's what it's about. The love. And Paul says that the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ consumes us. When Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when we step back and realize what Jesus Christ was willing to do for us, that great love that Jesus had for us and the great love that Jesus had for the world, Paul says we go out into the world and we make our, we go through persecution. We go through prison. We go through beatings. We go through whatever it takes so that we can just tell other people about the love of Christ. The love of Christ is so great. It says in the Gospel of Matthew that one day Jesus saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. The phrase they're moved with compassion means that Jesus was touched and moved in his innermost being. He was so moved that he was willing to give of himself from daylight till dark. Right? Jesus was so moved with love for people that he was willing to give of himself. He was willing to forego food. He was willing to forego rest. He was willing to set aside his own reputation and ambition. He was willing to set all of that aside so that he might be available for the Father to use him to tell people about salvation. And after Jesus was moved with compassion, he said this, Pray that the Lord of harvest would send forth other labors. I believe that Jesus will be praying and interceding over our sportsman banquet. I believe he'll be praying in many things. But you know what I believe Jesus primarily will be praying for? Father, call out laborers in Twin Oaks Baptist Church that will approach this with a heart like I have that will come, that will work, that will serve, that will pray, that will cook, that will do sweep up, that will set up, that will greet people, that will do whatever, that Father, call missionaries to come to this sportsman banquet, not worried about finding the best seat so they can sit there and eat what they want to eat, but coming with this desire, thinking, I don't know this person, how can I possibly get this person in a position to where this person can hear the gospel tonight and hopefully be saved? And by the way, the same man that's going to be speaking next Saturday night will be speaking both services next Sunday morning. As you and I see people coming into the church next week, we need to be reminded of this. There will be people that will come that this may be the first time they've ever entered into a church building, at least for a long, long time. That's why we do it. We don't do it to entertain our community. And we, our community come. But we do it to try to create an atmosphere so to, that if a man never goes to church, he will at least think, you know, I like to hunt, and that sounds kind of fun. And, and so I'll, and you can tell sometimes, can't you? When you see them coming in, they, they're so uncomfortable. We need to, as best we can, make them comfortable. Be there for them. There will be people that will come next Saturday night that their marriage is falling apart. There will be people that will be coming next Saturday night that financially they're about to lose everything. There will be people that will be hurting. There will be people that maybe have cancer or that have loved ones. There will be people coming. Everybody that comes will be coming with some kind of need. And so you and I need to be prepared for God to use us because not only to invite them to a wild game dinner, but to invite them to dine on the love and grace of Jesus Christ. 
God put a burden on Nehemiah's heart. Then God put a prayer on his lips. It says again in verse 4, he says, When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned. But he says, Then I dedicated myself to prayer and fasting for these people. Did his prayer do any good? As you read on through the story, here's what you will find out. Number one, God called Nehemiah to be the leader through that prayer. How did a man go from being a cupbearer to the leading example of a spiritual leader? He did so through those four or five months of prayer that God changed his heart. When he got ready to sit down and talk to the king about going, what does the king say? What do you need? Here's the kingdom credit card. Seriously. An unsaved king is going to say, what do you need, Nehemiah? And then when he gets there and he tells the people what they're going to do, the people are charging us and let's rise up and build. God changed everything through Nehemiah's prayer. And so before we do anything in this sportsman banquet, we need to be praying. David Jeremiah said this in his book on prayer. I scoured the New Testament some time ago looking for things that God does in ministry that are not prompted by prayer. Do you know what I found? Nothing. I don't mean I had trouble in finding an item or two. I mean I found nothing. Everything God does in the work, ministry, He does through prayer. If that is so, then we need to be praying. We need to be praying for the sportsman bank. We need to be praying for services. We need to be praying for our wanted. We need to be praying for our teens. We need to be praying for every ministry. If God's going to do what He's going to do in response to prayer, then we need to be praying, begging, pleading with God. Hudson Taylor, to quote from him again, he said this about prayer. He said, the prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I'm asking you as your pastor this week to be calling unto God to do a great and mighty thing next weekend. Again, it's not, I'm not talking about numbers. To be honest with you, if we had the facility, I believe I know now what to do to have a thousand people. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about salvation. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit being so strong that it grips someone's heart with the love of Jesus Christ. When Nehemiah heard about this, he sat down and he prayed. Verse 5, he said, I beseech thee, O Lord of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and let thine eyes be open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel. We have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though, they were, though you were cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, Yet will I gather them from thence and bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. What did Nehemiah pray for? Let me tell you three things quickly. Number one, Nehemiah prayed for the grace of God. God, we have sinned against you. We're asking you to be gracious to us. You know, it says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, I quote these verses a lot. I think they are fundamental. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin when there's sin in our life, we're only deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's when we're willing to confess our sin to God that God will be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, we've got some ladies that are going to come on Wednesday afternoon to scrub the kitchen. We use that kitchen so much, don't we? And so we only start out as clean as possible. And they're going to come and they're going to scrub that kitchen, the refrigerator, everything as sanitary as possible. But you want to know something? There's some other vessels that need to be scrubbed before next Wednesday night. And that's us. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver bowls, but there are also those of wood and earthenware, some for special use and some for ordinary use. 
So if anyone purifies himself from these things, sinful things, he will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master prepared for every good work. Flee from youthful passions. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. I think it's imperative that we make sure that every physical utensil that we use be as spotless as possible. But I want to tell you something, it's not going to do much good if we just physically scrub the kitchen and we don't scrub our own hearts. Just like people don't want to eat out of a dirty vessel, God doesn't want to use a dirty vessel. He won't use a dirty vessel. God is going to be looking for people this week that are willing to get before Him and ask for that cleansing. And and Satan is going to attack you. Can I tell you this? Satan is going to attack you. He knows how to get to you, Mark. And so he's going to look for ways to try to get you down to where you can think, God can't use me. Or, Brad, he's going to try to get you to say, Satan's going to try to get you to say, it's not that big of a deal. Nobody will even know what's going on in my life. But somebody will know it's God. And the Bible clearly says that God uses clean vessels. He's looking for people who will purify themselves through confession so that he might use them. Nehemiah prayed for the grace of God. Nehemiah prayed for the guidance of God. He said in verse 10, we're your servants, your people. You redeemed us. God, show us now what to do. Lead us. Nehemiah prayed for the goodness of God. Verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, now let, now let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of God, for I was the king's cupbearer. By this point in time, Nehemiah is sensing in his heart and spirit that he's the man that God's going to use. And so Nehemiah is saying, God, forgive me, forgive the people. God, be gracious to us. God, guide us what to do. God, pour out your blessings upon us so that you can use us in a great, great way. Did God use Nehemiah? Look at chapter 2. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was set before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not before time been sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. But king, you ask me, why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth in waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? King, you ask me why I'm sad, and this is why I'm sad. And he says he was afraid. Why is he afraid? Well, you know, Artaxerxes could have said, what do I care? Matter of fact, I believe four months earlier, Artaxerxes would have said, what do I care? What Nehemiah didn't know was, is that while he had been praying, and God had been changing Nehemiah's heart, God had been work in the palace, changing Artaxerxes' heart. Verse 4, then the king said unto me, what for what dost thou make request? So I shot up another prayer to the God of heaven. Oh, the door was wide open for him. Nehemiah had great success with the king. Nehemiah had great success with the people. Verse 17, he goes, he investigates the city. He doesn't even tell them why he's there. Then after he assesses the situation, he sits down with the people. Now, before I read this passage, I'll tell you something. They have tried multiple times for almost 100 years to rebuild the walls. What do you think would have been the general attitude when another cupbearer comes to be the construction foreman? What do you think the people might have said? (laughs) We've been down that road, buddy. What do you think we've been doing for the last hundred years? Have you looked around at some of these rocks? Some of these rocks weigh nearly a ton. Who do we have here in this city? They can build a wall like this. We've tried. It won't work. You want to know something? Four months before that, that's what they would have said. Look now what they say. Nehemiah said, I said unto them, You see the distress that we are in, and how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates are ever burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we no more be a reproach. Probably there was a moment of silence. 
Then I told them the hand of my God, which was upon good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. You know who these people are? You know who's going to rebuild the wall? One of the guys is a jeweler. Another guy is a perfume maker. The other guys are priests. There's one man out there with his two daughters. But God uses them. And notice Nehemiah's success with the work. Look at chapter 4. We'll jump ahead in the story as we bring this to a close today. Will God bless a man? He puts this burden on his heart in this kind of way, and a prayer on his lips and a plan in his mind. Will God use a man like this? Verse 6 of Nehemiah 4. It says, So built we the wall, and the walls was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. You know how long it took them to build the walls under Nehemiah's leadership? They've been trying it for almost 100 years. So how long do you think it took for them to rebuild the walls? 52 days. Less than two months. When the hand of God was upon them and when their hearts were right with God and when God was leading them and blessing them, God enabled them to do more than they could even dream or imagine. They didn't even think they could even begin to try to rebuild the walls. And some of the people built so far that they said, give me more to do. Some of them went the second mile because the hand of God was upon them. How did this happen? It happened because a weak man reckoned on God being with him. There was another great missionary before Hudson Taylor. The man's name was William Carey. Many people call William Carey the father of modern missions. God began to put a burden on William Carey's heart that we as believers need to be taking the gospel around the world. There were not missionaries in those days, back in the 1700s. People didn't raise support and go to another country to be a missionary. As a matter of fact, on one occasion, when William Carey stood up to tell the others the burden on his heart that other people around the world deserve to hear the gospel just as much as us, one elderly minister said this to him, Young man, sit down. When God is pleased to convert the heathen world, he will do it without your help or mine. That stunned William Carey, but it didn't stop him. William Carey kept studying. He kept praying. God had put such a burden in William Carey's heart that other people deserved a chance to hear the gospel, that William Carey would not give up. And a few years later, William Carey had the opportunity to be a spokesman for a group of ministers. And here's one of William Carey's most famous quotes. Expect great things and attempt great things. Expect God to be with you. Expect that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask. Expect that God can use a sportsman banquet to bring someone in who doesn't know the Lord and present to them. Expect them to come. Expect this man to be used by God. The gospel reached you, didn't it? Amen. The gospel reached you. The gospel reached you. The gospel reached you. Expect God to be working in a great way. And then William Carey said, then after that expectation, attempt to do great things. Step out and do it. I plead with you, as I will be individually, as I am, and as Tammy and I, as we are as a couple, I encourage you this week to be praying and praying and praying. Pray as a family. If you can get involved, I need you to get involved. We still, as far as I know, I guess need some desserts. Pretty much we do everything, other, but we need you to sign up. We still need workers. We, all, we always need workers. We need people who have a mind to work who will come. If you cannot come next Saturday night, I want to ask you to do something. If you cannot come next Saturday night, I want you during some time during the sportsman banquet I want you to just turn off the TV and have a prayer time. Be praying at that time. I want us to 
enter into this together as a church, believing, expecting great things and attempting great things. And I am praying for people's salvation. If what happens, what we think is going to happen, what we're praying is going to happen, the work will not end next Saturday night. The way this man will approach this is what he'll actually do is he will have, we will not register people at the door the way we normally register people at the door. He will, we will give them their card, registration card, while they're sitting there, and he will tell them that to register for the door prizes, they need to fill this out. And then he has a way on this card that they can indicate on this card either they've accepted Christ as their Savior or they've rededicated their life. And then, of course, they have to turn the card in to be eligible for the door prize. And that's when the work really begins. Because, you know, I don't know that I can't guarantee anything. He was telling me the other day, he said, he said brother, he said, I just did a sportsman banquet. They had 50 men. He said 10 of them got saved. Whatever it is, then we've got to go to visit them. So get ready. We've got to go visit them. We will have the names, their address. We will have according to the decision that they made. And we have got to reach out to them then and go visit them and make sure they know Christ is our Savior, get them baptized, get them into church, help them grow as a believer.